Um, with me today is Dr. Mercer. She's the Medical Officer of Health and CEO of Wellington Dufferin Guelph Public Health. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I, I know you're a very, very busy lady and this is a very busy time, so I do appreciate um, you taking the time to sit down with me to answer a few questions. And I think we want to just start with the basics for today. Um, and I want to talk specifically about COVID-19 and what the symptoms are and what people should be looking for. Well, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to tell your, your listeners a little bit more about COVID-19. So COVID-19 is a virus, uh, which means it's a little bit of a DNA or it's not a whole organism. Uh, and that's important to know because this particular virus only grows inside humans or in animals, but mostly in humans. So what that means is it needs a host. So the virus out in our community, if it's on a doorknob, will eventually die. It doesn't, it doesn't replicate. So this virus, which came from Wuhan, China, um, went around the world very quickly. And the reason it did so is because it was transferred by humans around the world as part of our activities. And it's very infectious. So now it's made its way to Dufferin County. So people who get uh, COVID-19 do so when they take a hand that is dirty and then they touch their face. That's really as simple as that. Or they get within six feet of somebody who's coughing or sneezing and puts their droplets of infection on them. So that's why there are some measures that we'll talk about a little bit later in your show about how to protect yourself. So really, you get this by taking your dirty hand, touching your face. So what happens if you do that? Well, we know that the incubation period for COVID-19 on average is about five and a half days. So that means that some people are going to have it fairly quickly. We think that children are more likely to develop symptoms a little bit earlier than adults. And some people are going to develop it a little later. So as late as up to 12 days. That's why you've heard of people isolating at home for 14 days is because we want to make sure that we catch everyone who's incubating within that 14 day window. So once you've incubated for whatever length of time, let's say about five days, most people will develop a cough or a sore throat or a fever. In fact, we do know that at least almost 80% of people will get a fever as part of this particular virus. Okay. Some people have very few symptoms though. So we know, for example, children, especially those under the age of 14, don't usually show much in the way of symptoms. They do probably get the disease. We can tell that from doing uh, serological tests, but they seem to have a much different course than adults who seem to get more sick with it. So you don't see a whole lot of cases in anybody under the age of 14, which should provide some comfort to the grandparents and parents um, that children seem to be doing a lot better than adults in this particular uh, disease. Talking about children and grandparents, um, and we're talking about physical distancing, and, and to me, um, it, it's all over the place, but I'm not sure everybody's truly understanding physical distancing, because I still see people that are bringing their kids to the park to play with other friends, or, and I know the parks have now been closed in Dufferin County and surrounding areas, um, but maybe you could speak to the importance of um, not necessarily always self-isolating, but the physical distancing, even when you're at the store going to the grocery store. Right. So I talked about how infectious this organism is and the ability that if you have it on your hands and you touch your face that you can get sick or if you're within six feet of people. So we know this organism is so infectious that we as a society and as a public health have introduced measures to keep people safe. That's why right now you can only congregate no more than groups of five. And we've closed schools, universities, daycares. We've told people to work remotely. We have really done a lot of things to try and force people to not have contact with others, except in your own little home, your own little family unit. So if you live by yourself, it's just your group of one. If you live with one or two other people, that's your isolation unit. Those are the people that you are in contact with. And what we want is for you to not be in contact with others. So this is not the time to invite people over for dinner, not the time to have a play date with friends, not a time absolutely to go to the park and allow your children to play with other children. Because what 
you're doing is you're increasing your chances that you are going to get sick. So as soon as one person in the household gets sick, then as you can see, we know from the literature, most people who go and get this disease do so from a contact. So usually within the family unit, it's pretty hard to socially distance from people who you live with, for example. It's possible, but it's not easy. And I think it's really important too, and I, I'm, I'm speaking from my own perspective, I have my 85 and 80 or seven year old parents, um, and it's been very hard to convince them initially that they need to stay inside um, because my mom's health is not as, um, as good as it should be. So we wanna make sure that there's no underlying conditions and she doesn't become in contact with anything. Um, but I think that people are finding it hard to stay inside um, but I think they don't realize the importance of doing so, especially with seniors or somebody with underlying health conditions. Oh, I can't emphasize that enough. It is so important that seniors stay home. That doesn't mean that they can't sit on their back porch or be in their garden by themselves. But what it absolutely does mean is don't go to Canadian Tire, don't go out and, and if you don't have to do your own shopping, get somebody to do it for you. People who are over the age of 70 disproportionately have poor outcomes. The mortality rate for people, especially if you're over the age of 80 and you get this disease, many of those individuals will die. It's disproportional, the deaths in people who have underlying medical problems. And those medical problems are often aren't that serious, actually. If we actually look at the data, sometimes they're just a, a diabetic. Uh, they have high blood pressure and they're on medication. Well, lots of seniors are on high blood pressure medication or are diabetic. So yes, please stay home. It is not just for your, you know, not just to, for your well-being, it's actually potentially to keep you alive. Absolutely. And I think that's so incredibly important. And I'm hoping that all of my listeners are paying attention um, as we've made uh, arrangements in our family that we, we drop off the groceries on the porch and everything gets wiped down and disinfected. And, you know, there's no actual contact, even with myself and my parents or my sister and my parents. So please, if you are listening, this is of the utmost importance um, that you are taking these things under, under advisement and practicing them daily. So let's talk a little bit about when somebody has some of the symptoms, the fever, the sore throat, what should they do? Well, um, so for most people who get these symptoms, their symptoms are usually relatively mild, especially if you're younger. So in the same way, if you get a bad cold, you just stay home and you get better. That's what we're asking people to do, stay home, 14 days, don't go anywhere. If your symptoms are kind of more serious, you've got a pretty bad cough or a bad sore throat, and you would normally want to go see your family doctor, why don't you call them? Most family doctors right now are taking telephone appointments. So they can talk to you over the phone. They can find out how serious your symptoms are and perhaps even prescribe something for you. So that would be option number two. And if you are getting short of breath, you're having trouble, you can't lie down, you really can't catch your breath that's a serious symptom so for people who are short of breath that is the time that you may want to visit either an assessment center or perhaps an emergency room near you to be assessed and there are assessment centers set up I know at Headwaters Healthcare where you can it's yes. just a drive up procedure and I think that that's what we encourage people to do rather than walking into the um, emergency room right off the bat is, is finding an assessment center hopefully that's close to them would that be the best thing well, to do? I think if they're really struggling to breathe, they call 911 and the paramedics will take them to the closest emergency room. We certainly don't want to delay necessary care. Um, but if you think that you're not sure and you think that you're short of breath, but not that short of breath, and you want to see, be seen at the assessment center, Headwaters um, Healthcare Center has an assessment center uh, set up where they will see you, potentially test you for COVID-19 as well, and may send you to the hospital emergency room if needed. Um, so there, what is the difference between self-isolation and self-monitoring? Okay, really, really good question. So for most of us who right now who are out and about, we haven't contacted anybody, we are being asked to stay home. So in self monitoring was really for people who've been in contact with somebody uh, or have returned from travel potentially and are checking themselves to see if they have symptoms. We don't want those people going out, but we if they do go out, they have to know maybe I just check make sure how I, I'm feeling. So that's a potential. But if I look for um, self-isolation, those are people who we need to stay home. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, my next question would be with regards to, I know there's been a change in the terminology between social distancing and physical distancing, and maybe you could clarify the difference between both social and physical distancing and why that's changed. Um, well, really, they were both words uh, that were started to ensure that people stayed two arms length, uh, a hockey stick, two meters, six feet, whatever term you want to use. They're all the same, that you stay away from others. So that is meant to keep you safe. In addition to know where your hands are, keep your hands clean. If you touch something, either a hand sanitizer, Purell, keep your hands clean, wash them and don't touch your face. So really both terms mean the same thing, social distancing and uh, uh, and physical distancing. Some people don't like the word social distancing though, because really what we want is we want people to socially connect so you can mm -hmm. FaceTime, Skype like we're doing right now, or telephone, uh, call people, write a letter. We don't necessarily want people to be socially disconnected, but we absolutely do want people to be physically disconnected. And there are some amazing, wonderful ideas that people are doing in order to not be close to each other and, and still being social. And as you mentioned, Skyping, I've got friends that uh, we did a cocktail party via uh, Zoom or Skype and or possibly a dinner party. There are different ways that you can be in contact with people. And I urge people as well, if, if you know people that are on their own and they're in their own homes, give them a call. Um, send them a text. Just see how everybody's doing because everybody needs that social aspect to their life as well. And I think that's really important. Yes, um, so, <laughs> let's talk about to, um, the need for PPE equipment. If you could explain what's in need for the local hospitals and what people might be able to do to help out um, the, their communities. Right. So that's a great question. So when we talk about PPE or personal protective equipment, I think what most people think about immediately is a mask, face masks. It also means goggles or visors, gloves and gowns as well. Those are all things that healthcare workers use to protect themselves from the droplets that may be sprayed on them when somebody coughs or sneezes and they're working in close contact with somebody. So I think it's important and I've often get asked this question, well, what about those of us who are out in the public, why are we not wearing masks? Why why only are the healthcare workers wearing masks? And I think that there's a really good reason for that. Most people who wear masks are not used to wearing masks. And uh, therefore, guess what? They touch their face to put them on. They touch their face throughout the day to adjust them. And they touch their face to take them off. So people who wear masks, unless you're very experienced, will touch your face more often. So like I said at the beginning, this the most important thing that you need to know to protect yourself is keep your hands clean and don't touch your face and stay two meters, six feet, one hockey stick away from everybody in your surrounding. You can be safe. So what do healthcare workers need? Well, healthcare workers can't stay six feet away from their patients. In fact, many of them have to work in that circle all the time in order to help the people who are ill. So they do need a mask and they do need the supplies to protect themselves. We know that this pandemic has put a strain on all of the resources for all of the healthcare facilities, including Headwaters Healthcare Center and any other hospital or, or family doctor's uh, office, for example. They are all short on supplies. So for any listener, if you have access to masks, gloves, gowns, face shields, goggles, there is a place for those in the healthcare system and people would really like to have access to those supplies. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Mercer, so much for joining us and, and sharing this valuable information. And uh, I wish you all the health and safety and, and we, we are going to throw a quick shout out to all of the frontline workers um, saying thank you for everything that you do. But thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. You're very welcome. And just remind your listeners that please stay home. By you staying home, it keeps us safe because we have to go to work for you. Has COVID-19 affected the food bank with regards to the need for food? Um, so we have seen a need for food uh, increase in the last little while. Individuals who um, were employed, who got layoff notices very quickly into this, um, are starting to come and access the food bank, um, as well as individuals who didn't have the money to go out and buy large um, stores of food to keep them going. Um, they're accessing the food bank as well. 
Right. And I hear that there's something new called the Dufferin Food Share. So why don't you tell me a little bit about what Dufferin Food Share is and what the changes are? Absolutely. So about three weeks ago, uh, when COVID-19 um, really started becoming a, a large concern uh, for us, we decided that we needed to change the way that we do business. So here at the food bank, we've always been a shopping model where individuals would come into the food bank, they'd access the food like a grocery store, and they'd leave again. So we changed to a drive-through model um, in order to make sure that clients were safe, volunteers were safe, um, and, and to make sure that um, it was still had a safe and um, secure source of food. And then as we did that for a couple of weeks, um, the more this became a bigger situation than probably a lot of us expected that it would be, um, we started talking to the other community partners that we have in Orangeville. And so that was um, St. Mark's um, uh, Anglican Church. It was Westminster United, Salvation Army, uh, St. Vincent de Paul, as well as us. Um, and we all came together and decided that we could find a way to um, meld our services together and have a centralized point that people could access food instead of having to go to all of these smaller food banks to get enough food to survive in a month. Um, so with that, the Dufferin Food Share was born. Um, we opened up on Monday, so uh, March 30th, at the Salvation Army uh, Church, so that's 690 Riddell Road, um, and we worked at having centralized hours so that it would be helpful. At the same time, um, a smaller food bank that, that we'd been in partnership for quite some time, uh, the Grand Valley Food Bank, the Concern, um, also joined us and they have moved their location from where they were um, over to the um, arena at 690 Main, or pardon me, at 90 Main Street North. And they're operating um, with hours like ours and providing the same kinds of foods that, that we are. We wanted a consistent food source that would provide perishables and non-perishables to people in this, in this time of need. Wonderful. So can you give us an idea with regards to the change of procedures for processing the food items, how you are incorporating the physical distancing for staff and the people that are coming to use your services? Absolutely. So right now, typically we would go to a grocery store, we would pick up the food and we bring it back to the food bank and sort it. But right now what we're doing is we're actually um, quarantining, if you'd like, the food for three days to make sure that any viruses that might be on the outside of bags, it might be out on the outside of bags, um, it's, uh, it, it's sort of left to dissipate. Um, and then uh, we sort that as we always have to make sure that the best before dates are taken care of and, and that kind of thing. Um, but we also have um, made sure that we have limited volunteers in our building and that they stay six feet away from each other um, at all times. And we've actually even moved our food manager over to the Salvation Army um, so that she and I aren't um, together just in case one of us becomes uh, or co comes in contact with COVID-19. Um, and when we look at staffing the Salvation Army, uh, what we've done is every day has a different set of volunteers and none of them would cross over into the other shifts so that even if something happens and, and, and somebody becomes, you know, um, I hate the word infected, but comes in contact with COVID-19, um, we're only going to lose that one group of volunteers as opposed to lo losing all of the volunteers in one shot. So we're really working hard. We, uh, the County of Dufferin has been a huge supporter in all of this, as has emergency management. Um, they've really helped us with the planning of this and they're coming into our building and they're cleaning twice a day. Uh, they're providing us with some of the things that are really hard for people to get right now, like hand sanitizer um, and, and generally being supportive of, of the efforts that, that we all have to, to make to make sure everybody's taken care of. Well, I, I do commend you on the thought process behind it because I'm sure when all this started, none of us really realized what was what we were really walking into. I mean, you saw the news, you've been, and everybody's uh, you know glued to what's happening um, across the world. But I don't think any of us really thought how that would affect us. And I want to commend you for the thought process and the fact that you have you've separated yourself from your food manager so that there's always somebody if somebody does happen to develop symptoms or come in contact with somebody you've got that backup and the fact that your your shifts are different as well you've got that backup mm -hmm. in that so that people are still able to um, take advantage of your services that you're providing and all of the extra efforts mm -hmm. that you put into doing this so uh, very well done like I, I I'll be honest, that didn't occur to me at first. It was just, it's just like a, everybody, you don't think about 
what happens until uh, until it actually happens. So. No, and, and Steve Murphy, th this county is very fortunate to have an emergency manager like Steve Murphy. Um, and he has loaned us um, Jennifer Roach as a, um, an emergency management liaison who's been helping us with all of this. And then we've got the terrific uh, volunteers we've always had at the food bank. So everybody will be familiar with uh, Colleen Egan and Willie Brown, a dynamic duo. And Colleen is self-isolating at home uh, to make sure that she stays safe. And uh, she is the communications behind all of this, which is fantastic, and the scheduling of the volunteers. And Willie is still doing his warehouse duties and uh, making sure that, that, that we keep the food safe. Um, so always grateful for, for all the people who've come to us and, and support us in this. Is, it, is there still a need for you to, to increase your number of volunteers because of this situation or how, how does that work? Um, so what we're doing right now is anybody who wants to volunteer with this can contact um, an email address at contact at dufferinfoodshare.org. And then volunteers are put on a, a, a list right now so that when or if um, we have people who, who show symptoms, we can uh, sub people into that uh, process. And then we're also working on a delivery service uh, with the help of um, the drivers from the County of Dufferin for the Meals on Wheels program um, to make sure that we can support people who are immune compromised, who are in quarantine, who may be elderly or who have mobility issues. Um, so there may be a need for some volunteers for that as well. That is absolutely ph phenomenal because I think one of the things that no matter who I speak to about COVID-19, one of the things that we really 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 need to understand as a community is you really do need to stay away from other people and if you don't need to be out because um the bylaws and everything's are changing on an hourly almost almost hourly basis at this point that you really shouldn't be out so um the delivery service i think is just um a phenomenal idea with regards to reaching those people that can't leave either because they are too uh, there's no reason to go out if you don't have to and and uh, we want to make sure that everybody's protected and safe and healthy so that's that's wonderful yeah and and we'll be accepting referrals for that program through healthcare providers um, through perhaps some um, the lins uh, telecheck um, services and housing in the province um, the uh, Dufferin Area Family Health Team, the COVID-19 uh, Assessment Center. So those are the people that we'll be accepting referrals from uh, just to make sure that we can manage this program as we get it up and off the ground so it's it's not so overwhelming in the beginning. Yeah, and let's, let's talk about the actual supply side of things as well. Sure. Um, with regards to Number one, what is what are you most in need of right now? What can we let our viewers know that you're most in need of? And what is the process of getting this to you safely? Um, and the process that everybody should follow and not just show up. So surprisingly enough, um, our challenge right now is is some of the fresher pro, uh, um, produce that we're struggling a little bit to get um, on board right now. So bizarrely things like bananas uh really hard to get your hands on so it's uh, and then we move on to the non-perishables the non-perishables um the the donations at the grocery store are down because not a lot of people are, are going out right now and and this is a financially stressful time for all of us so and any kinds of non-perishables um and so we're looking for things like peanut butter things like um sidekicks canned pasta um, those things that are, are easy meals, chunky soups, uh, condensed soups. Um, so those are the kinds of things we're looking for. The other thing that we're doing is uh, we're wanting to make sure that kids have enough nutrition. And with schools being closed, that means that breakfast programs and lunch programs aren't being accessed. So to have um, extra snacks for kids is, is really important. Um, sometimes uh, I think people are a little um, cautious about some of the, the items that we're asking for. When we're asking for canned pasta and sidekicks and that sort of thing, they're, we know that they're not the greatest nutrition. We absolutely understand that. But if you live in a rooming house and all you have access to is either a kettle or a microwave, you can actually eat those things and not have to worry too much about food storage and that sort of thing. They're not the greatest nutrition, but they will keep you alive. So it, it's those kinds of things that, that we're looking for. Um, I know that um, canned meat right now is big on our list. Uh, please no more tuna. 
We're good with tuna for right now, as we are for dried pasta. Um, but uh, things like chicken and turkey uh, and ham, those those are, are big for us right now. So anything people can do to support us would be greatly appreciated. Absolutely. And I know we have Easter coming up and, 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 and you know, holidays and celebrations, which are taking a new face altogether as to how we're going to celebrate these things. And, you know, I, we, I'm an absolute fan of um, being on social um, social media to, and reaching out to those people. But there are a lot of people, too, that are home by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to make sure that all of this um, is, is reaching them as well. Um, and remembering that we're going to all follow the rules. But going back to yeah. Easter, uh, there's just so many things that we don't need to be concerned with turkey so much as we are concerned with making sure that people are fed and happy. And, and as you said, understanding that not everything is of the highest nutrition, but at this point in, in time, I think we're, we're just wanting to make sure that people are actually fed um, and, and staying yeah. healthy. Absolutely. And, and we've had some extremely generous offers from the community. Um, so if everybody's familiar with the cafe at Center Fellowship Church, Barb White and her crew are cooking up vats of soup for us as we speak. Um, they've been huge supporters of our, uh, of our food bank for a long time, and, and we very much appreciate them. Uh, Vanessa and Terry that everybody's familiar with at Lavender Blue Catering, um, they're putting together some great things and as the food has come in from restaurants, Barb, Terry, and Vanessa have taken that food and made it, turned it into meals for us. So that's, that's fantastic. And then we had a great email from somebody the other day who said, you know, I'm really trying to figure out how I can support local businesses right now. Um, but I also want to support the food bank. So this particular gentleman uh, went to Barb at the chocolate shop and is ordering um, Easter bunnies uh, to oh. drop off to the food bank. I know, to send out to tiny ones. And then Home Sense and Winners yesterday dropped off all of their Easter chocolate for us. So we're going to be able to put those into bags next week, which is awesome. Because even though we're not able to celebrate like we normally would, if I think back to my kids when they were younger, Easter bunnies are part of what goes on. And, and we do have to reduce our expectations these days. But, you know, there, there's something about trying to make um, these holidays special for children that it, it we're all striving for that. So this, it was just an awesome thing. It just warmed my heart. It was just fabulous. So it absolutely warms my heart. I think I've had a smile on my face and, and, and since you said that. And I think that yes. um, it's very important. I mean, there are different ways for you to meet with your family. There are mm -hmm. all different, you know, there's Skype, there's Zoom. There's so many, you know, technological ways that you can spend time with your family without being in the same room with them. Um, but uh, always remembering that, oh my goodness, it does. It warms my heart just thinking about kids receiving Still being able to receive some chocolate and some Easter happiness um, in the holidays as well. So how do people go about dropping off um, donations? Is it still the same process or has that changed? Uh, no, people can come by and they can drop off at the food bank. Um, we're not accepting donations inside the food bank right now unless it's a really large donation. Um, we were lucky enough to have the Children's Foundation um, yesterday and Food and Friends programs drop off the food from the local schools. And they did come around back and ring the buzzers. Um, and, and we've taken those donations for, um, for the kids programs and that sort of thing. We had uh, Westside and several schools in our area do that. And we've been super lucky to have Heather Verpalen and Anita McFarland from uh, Food and Friends uh, and the Children's Foundation supporting that. Um, let's talk about how COVID-19 um, has affected your business. Um, well, clearly the dining room is closed. Um, the government has made it so we're uh, delivery, takeout, and um, pickup only. Um, so that's been challenging. I mean, we would have, you know, anywhere from two to four, five, six servers on the floor, you know, depending on the day, and, and their job is now obsolete. So, you know, so we've had to uh, lay off approximately 12 employees, uh, including my own children um you know and and adjust a big adjustment is um food you know preparing the food um and getting it ready and doing the orders and making sure everything's fresh it's you know this the food's not moving as quickly as it was before so we're having to change our par levels very quickly um to you know to make sure that things aren't going bad because you know when you know your profit margin goes down the last thing you want to do is throw out food right so um that was a huge adjustment at first we're kind of getting it now 
Um, but yeah, it's it's been a challenge. No doubt, no doubt. So how, with all these new procedures and regulations that have been put in place, stating that number one, you can't be open, obviously. Number two, it is, it, you're trying to keep contact as limited as possible. How, how, how have your procedures changed in this respect? Um, well, um, every time someone comes in, we disinfect the debit machine. We um, disinfect the door handles. Um, public health has actually um, given us a notice to put on doors. I don't know if if every restaurant has done it. I can't speak for them, but um, the notice states, you know, you can't come in if you've had contact with someone with COVID. So, you know, when we have a nurse show up who works at the hospital, I have to tell them they can't come in, you know. You have to stay outside. We'll bring your stuff. We have a bench out front. and. Right put their stuff there and they have to come and get it. And I, I you know, it's not personal, but um, yeah. So the health board has, has put those regulations in um, and it's just sanitize, 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 everything, your hand, your debit machines, the counter, the menu, everything between, you know, between patrons as much as you possibly can, you know, like there's not a room for error. So yeah. No, there is. We have to be extremely careful and we can't stress it enough to anybody who's watching is you can't just go places because you decided that you want something to eat. You need to call these orders in, place them ahead of time and follow the proper procedures, please, please. Because um, we do want to flatten the curve and we do want to stop from spreading this within our own community as, as much as we possibly can. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So above and beyond what you normally do, because... Um, I'm not sure if everybody knows it, but you all should, that Miss Jennifer Betts is a wonderful provider and supporter of this community and has done many, many fundraisers for schools and organizations and everything. Um, but it doesn't stop during the COVID-19 pandemic um, either. Um, Jennifer, you've been providing some extra services for people. And, and because in the beginning of this, um, everybody, a lot of people panicked and went and cleared shelves of grocery stores of meat and all these essentials that we need to survive. Um, so let's tell us a little bit about what you've been doing to help the community. So um, I had a few friends reach out and say, can you order us this? Can you order us that? And, uh, you know, so I thought, I can, I can do that. So I thought, um, is, this a, is this a need? Because it's just my husband and I, right? So we don't have to buy a lot of food. So, um, I didn't realize that meat shelves were empty. I didn't realize that people couldn't get yeast. I couldn't, didn't realize people couldn't get flour, right? So um, I thought, I'm just going to make a little post and put it out on social media. And I thought, you know, I might get five, six people who <laughs> want, you know, want this. And uh, in the first two hours, 53 people put, a, put an order in with me. And I thought I might have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> But I got through it and I got the order in and it's evolving. Uh, we put it in twice a week. Um, it's evolving depending on what I can get. And we're, 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 you know, we're, we're ironing out the kinks, you know, we're started doing order numbers instead of just coming in and trying to find your name amongst all of these names and, you know, and uh, everything is prepaid, right? So you just come in, you, you know, we have a list of what you, what you got. And, you know, it's all labeled uh, on different tables or whatever. And you just come in, you grab your stuff. We have an exit door so people don't have to pass each other in the alcove at the front door. And, you know, they go on their way and, and it's very minimal contact. There's no lineups and people are really enjoying it because, you know, it really hit me the other day when I was driving by No Frills and, and I saw the people in the carts every five feet down the sidewalk. And I said, oh, well, no wonder people are so happy to come in the diner and just grab and go, you know? So, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I didn't realize it had gotten to that. Um, honestly, uh, the meat sales has, has gotten me so busy that my head's been in a computer or in my laptop or wherever it is and my phone for hours at a time trying to, you know, respond to questions and, and see, can we get this? Can we get that? And yeah so um that's what we did and it's working out well and um i've been uh approached by a produce uh company who wants to start doing fresh produce next week so oh, that's amazing. yeah so their 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 goal is to limit the exposure as well 
right, in the grocery stores. And, you know, just you order, you pay, you grab, you go. So, um, so yeah, so we started doing that. So I think that's, you know, I think that's really important. And I think one of the things that we're going to see more and more as time goes on, as we're going all going through this as a community, is businesses are going to adapt to the new situation, which I think is what you've done well. Not only are you providing some products that people can't find or couldn't initially find absolutely and the service of being able to get it quick and not waiting in line and um i i do um commend our grocery stores for what they're doing here in town to make sure that everybody is staying safe oh yeah they're, they're working hard yeah they, they are, are working, working hard as you are as well. And I think it's important that we're going to see these adaptations. And as a community, we need to support the businesses because we want to get on the other side of this. And we want to make sure that these businesses are still there when we get on the other side of it as well. So you will see these adaptations, uh, whether some people will start to sell products online and what and what you're doing with regards to providing even more services. It started off with meat and then it became flour and then it became yeast and then it became you know, disinfectant toilet spray. Paper. And, yeah, and toilet paper. I never That's thought right. I would be selling toilet paper, but here I am <laughs> selling toilet paper. <laughs> you know? Well, that's a whole, you could do a whole show on how the shortage of toilet paper is mind boggling and whatnot yes. and can understand. But, um, you know, we, we as a community, thank you for what you do um, for, for helping to provide um, things that people can't get. And it did. It, it started with a couple of friends asking you, but you turned it into a way to help the community, which I think is very admirable. Much for yeah. that. No. It, yeah. Um, so, how how are, what other ways can people support restaurants in town? Um, I mean, I know. First of all, I have another question. First, is is it difficult for takeout for for breakfast food? Because I mean, your ba I know you do a lot lunch food as well, but. Is it hard for takeouts now? You are still offering no. specials. Well, we do. We, we've always done a lot of takeout. And that's something that surprised me when I bought the restaurant. Because I thought, nobody's going to get takeout eggs. But we do. And we put them in pizza boxes. You know? Because when you got runny eggs, you don't want them flipping flopping all over the place. Right? So we put them in a nice sturdy box. And it works out fine. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's amazing. Because I, I wouldn't have thought that, just as you said, that breakfast would be a, a takeout I, option. I, but I didn't think it would. But we do actually do, before this, do quite a bit of takeout. Now we do only takeout. But uh, before this, we actually did quite a bit. Yeah. Wonderful. So how? what are other ways that um, people in our community can support um, restaurants in, in uh, Orangeville and Dufferin County surrounding well, areas? Well, you know, um, Obviously, by by ordering takeout delivery, you know, um, I, I don't know all the restaurants that are open or if they've closed. Um, you know, people are uh, people can buy gift cards, you know, so when they want to go out for dinner, when this is over with their husband, wife, whatever, um, you know, they, it's already paid for. But it's it's money that's going to get this restaurant through right now. Um, just. Uh, the other day, Peter Pitt was delivering to the hospital, you know, so I, I know Melanie, I've known Melanie many years, wonderful, wonderful community supporter, um, great people. And I just said, Mel, what do you need? And she said, uh, do you want to donate some money to send some money to the, or send some, sorry, food to the hospital? And I said, sure. And I sent her over some money and, you know, and, and these things are helping, you know, them stay afloat. Um, yeah, I, I don't, you know, talking to your friends, sharing their posts, their Facebook oh, absolutely. posts, you yeah, know, just gonna, you know, if you can't, yeah, if you can't, um, if you're not planning, if you're saving your money and, and watching your pennies and you can't necessarily order out right now, that's totally understandable, but you can support the local businesses by just sharing their posts on social media, yeah. be it Twitter, Instagram, uh, or Facebook, get out there and share it to your friends because I'm sure there are people out there that are able to support it. And the buying of gift certificates is a wonderful idea. Um, there are birthdays and things that are all going to come up through this time where we can't always see each other and spend the time that we had wanted together. Um, but even buying gift certificates as gifts for people that they can use when these restaurants and these establishments and these businesses open, um, I think is a great way to do it. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot more answers for you on that one. Um, <laughs> 
you know, I don't, you know, I know a lot of restaurant owners on a personal level, you know, so uh, being, you know, I was a waitress for 20 years before I bought a restaurant, right? So you get to know people and, you know, I, I you know, just if they're open and you can, you can, uh, you know, you have an extra few bucks, just, you know, treat yourself and, and keep them going because the rent doesn't stop. You know, the hydro doesn't stop. The gas doesn't stop. The, you know, they're still paying their payroll from, you know, on the 15th of next month for last month, you know, and they're, you know, the HST is due for many businesses at the end of April. And you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of things going on. Right. So uh, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that, you know, people don't think about when they're not in a business person or in the industry. Right. So, and I think the government's doing some things, but there's a lot of things that don't stop, you know, and, and the money's got to be there, you know, and if the sales aren't there and the money's not there, you know, then, they're either digging out for years or, you know, they're closing their doors, which is really sad. I mean, yeah, it's definitely, I mean, we have such an amazing community and I, I usually um, always mention that I, when I'm, when I'm on my show and, um, and, and I'm going to say again, we have an amazing supportive community where, you know, restaurants yes. that are in are donating food to feed the frontline workers, as you were mentioning yourself, being a part of it with Pita Pit. And there are so many restaurants that are offering free delivery and, trying to get it, you know, um, if you happen to know somebody that's isolated on their own, that's either in self-isolation due to COVID-19 or just being very careful because they have underlying health conditions, there are ways that you can send and order food that can be delivered to them. Um, one of the great things that you can do online that doesn't require any money at all is go online and provide some amazing five-star reviews for all of these lovely businesses that we have here in town um, and continue to support them any way you can. And like I said, every little bit counts. So we want to make sure that we're we're not forgetting anybody so that everybody can make it through this and so we can get to the other side and uh, once again get all together and have some some good laughs and some good fun and some great food for sure we have we have fantastic restaurants in orangeville fantastic you know we're known for it we're we, you know orangeville loves to eat out you yeah. know they just they do you know so if we lose you know lose some of that it's gonna it's gonna you know it's not gonna yeah. be it's not going to be good. Yeah, it's not going to be the same, that's for sure. And Julie and I are going to be speaking to you today about homeschooling and learning from home. So Julia, we are in a unique uh, situation that we've never been in before with COVID-19. And I think um, uh, the schools have begun to... to um, provide work from home and you're you are normally a homeschooler yes I am so how many children do you have I have uh, one child a girl and she is six years old and I've been homeschooling her for um, three years now uh, since kindergarten amazing and you were homeschooled yourself I believe yes I was I was homeschooled um, until grade eight uh, with my three other siblings. We were all homeschooled till grade eight, and then we all went to high school after that. Wonderful. So let's talk about the homeschooling process. So for you individually, when, when you were growing up, was it a difficult situation to be homeschooled? No, not for me. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the time that I got to spend with my family. Um, I feel you know, the way that my mom taught, um, we really learned a lot of independence. Um, you know, we were inspired to learn things ourselves. Um, and she gave us a lot of uh, freedom of how we want to control our time. So we learned at a young age, if you work hard, you get your work done, then you get more, more play time, you know, for time for things you want to do and, and that kind of thing. And it was really, um, you know, no stress as a child, which I really appreciated, especially when I when I got older and, you know, learned what stress was, but it was uh, it was a great experience for me. So with the parents that are no, it's, it's, it's a very new situation for many people to have their kids home um, on a daily basis and to be home. Uh, personally on a daily basis. So where should they, they begin when they're looking at helping to provide education? Now, we're not suggesting that everyone become homeschoolers um, because everything will go back to normal one day um, and we will be going back to normal. But there's a lot of education 
that the children have been missing over these past few weeks, that uh, where should they begin when they're starting to look at helping to provide their education for their kids? Uh, well, I would suggest looking um, at the Ontario curriculum, which is online, even if your child's in school, it's just a good idea to know where your goal is for the end. And keep in mind that it's the goal, you know, for the end of the year, um, that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, I always say, like, there's a lot of different ways you can teach your child and a lot of different resources. So, you know, if you're, you're probably getting uh, resources from your school, but if you feel you need more, there's a lot out there, especially with the internet um, and things like that. So that's kind of the first step, just seeing how you want to do things and uh, what you should be looking right. to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And looking, I think looking towards uh, what what level they're, they're at and what they should be learning on with the curriculum is one thing. Um, and I know the schools for those people who are not homeschooling um, will be providing information for you. But as, as Julia mentioned, there's a lot of resources out there um, for you to get some more information. So what do you feel the most the first few like the first few days of getting into this? What are the challenges that the parents may face who have never um, been in this situation before? Well, I think, um, you know, the, the children themselves are not going to be used to their parents leading their learning. So there's going to be a huge shift there and probably some resistance, let's face it. Um, <laughs> you know, and, you know, kids will be missing their peers and it's just a, a different environment. So even parents, you may be feeling overwhelmed and that's okay. Um, so once you are okay with all that, um, you have to find what works for your family. So, you know, for some people having a written down schedule, you know, time limits for everything that works for them. For some people that does not work. You need a little more flexibility. Um, you know, like you need to make sure that everyone had their full breakfast before you start math, even if it's past nine o'clock, uh, you know, and, um, you know, some people might feel pressure to have the same routine, you know, Monday to Friday. Uh, it doesn't have to be like that. And again, it depends on what the school you're involved with is doing. But, um, you know, you can change it up. It doesn't have to be the same uh, every day because we're not all in the same mood every day. And um, it's okay to shift things around, um, you know, based on how you're feeling or what's going on in the day. And I think that's important too, because this is new to everybody. And I think keeping more of a fluid attitude with seeing what works and what doesn't work, what you may want to do may not work for your kids. Um, mm -hmm. You wanting to start and, and do school from nine to 11 and then one to three may not be what the kids are going to go for, or it may not work out just in the running of your household. Cause some people have one child and then, you know, it's unlimited to how many children could actually be in your home. So there's a way to kind of get them all focused and try to do it with a group. And if it doesn't work as a group, then you're working individually one-on-one. -on -one. So I think you hit it on the head where it's, in, it's really important to keep that focus. Um, but at the same time, having that fluid attitude that, you know what, this isn't working. Let's try something else. Yeah. Maybe we have, you know, a, you know, half an hour, you know, go play outside in the backyard, staying contained, of course, keeping in mind we're, we're, we're talking about COVID-19 and um, having the physical distancing. If you're a family and you're in your own home, um, you're good to be together, but you don't want to be inviting other children over or doing any other play dates and that sort of thing, because um, we definitely want to avoid that. But having those breaks, maybe having breaks more often um, or just, you know, maybe we only do it in the morning, in the afternoon. It's all, you know, it's fun and playtime and family time or whatever happens to be. But I think keeping a fluid attitude um, and seeing what works with the kids and depending on how many you have and, and how it works, I think are, would be ideal. Yeah. Do you have tips with regards to keeping the kids focused? Because as you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation together, um, you know, it's different when it, it's a parent trying to teach their child. It's very, very different because you're not going, you're not in that school environment. You don't have, it's not necessarily the same level of, of uh, respect and focus, I guess is the way to put it. Um, any tips on how they could keep the kids focused? Yeah, um, I guess my first, my first tip is to keep things simple, simple for you and the child. The less little things to focus on, uh, focus on, the more distracted you'll get. So 
keep things simple. Um, set clear expectations for your child so they know what they have to do. So um, it could be like a time expectation. We are going to do this activity for 30 minutes or it could be a work expectation. You know, we're going to go until you're done this worksheet. And then once you're done that, then we can do this. So the, the children need to know what is expected of them because otherwise they don't know what to do. So you have to, you have to tell them. Um, you know, another tip is that you can use what interests your child. So for example, when I was first teaching my daughter uh, simple addition and subtraction, we used goldfish crackers because that was her favorite snack. And it made it a lot of fun and she didn't really realize she was working, but um, I don't do that anymore. Or, you know, but uh, find what interests your child. If it's, um, you know, dogs and you're working on counting, you can count what, how many dogs you see out the window, go for a walk or um, things like that. Um, and then I also rec recommend using the child's strengths. Um, so if you have control of what you're working on or what order, I always suggest don't start with the hardest subject. So if your child's, you know, weak in, um, we'll just keep it simple with, you know, addition, don't start with a paper uh, worksheet full of addition. It's just going to be frustrating. Um, you know, use their strength or do something with them at first. So let's skip count together first, you know, so they can start in a positive way. Um, and do interactive activities if you can. Uh, worksheets is one type of learning, but uh, different types of learning um, will help uh, keep your child focused. Um, you know, for example, if you're working on fractions, you can use baking. If you're using on money sense, you can set up a store. And again, you can have all different levels of, if you have children working on, uh, you know, different levels of stuff, you can have one person, you know, they have to count single things and then the other person has to, you know, make combinations of money and then the other person has to add all the totals, you know, so you can make it hard so and interactive with uh, children working at different levels. Um, and then, like you said earlier, um, having appropriate breaks for their age. Uh, you know, even though a child's in school eight hours a day, doesn't mean it's easy for them to focus more than 20 minutes. So, uh, you know, keep checking in on what your child's actually able to do. Um, so I, they have worked really hard for 20 minutes, you know, with my daughter, she does get very distracted. So um, if she's losing her, her focus, then, okay, let's do 10 jumping jacks now. Okay, and then one more row of questions. Okay, and then after 10 push-ups, she likes doing those kind of things. 10 push-ups and then, uh, you know, another row of questions. Um, and then another tip is if you're feeling frustrated as the parent, just stop because nothing good comes when you're trying to teach or direct when you're frustrated. Um, your children will feel the frustration. Um, you know, you may start fighting and then uh, when you go back to try school the next day, you know, it creates a pattern. So you, if you're feeling frustrated, you wanna stop that pattern right away. Take a break, have your coffee, you know, quiet time, whatever you need to do to kind of restart and then you can try the activity again or. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's great advice for sure. And I think um, because it's, it's all new and I mean, with the curriculum that the schools and the school boards are providing to people, I mean, it's not meant to be eight hours a day. I think it depends on the age and what they're providing. Yeah. Um, so looking at all of that and kind of working it out, whereas if they're doing, you know, um, three hours a week for four different subjects and that's 12 hours or whatever it happens to be, which I believe is what's working with the high school students, high school students obviously are going to be working independently and on their own. And if they need help, then they have the resources for that. Um, but I think there's always something to be said for um, maybe adding in a bit, a little bit extra if you know that you're working on mathematics and they're and they, problems are addition or subtraction or division or whatever it happens to be. There are other resources that you can do that are fun. There are online games that you can play that also teach um, addition that can, can just help enhance um, 
what your what the children have to do for school as well. So let's talk about other types of resources that are available for the parents. We mentioned some online things, but what else is available? Um, there's some kind of some support groups that can um, be helpful for some people. For example, there's the Headwaters Homeschooling Network, which has a Facebook group. So, um, you know, if you want support from people who homeschool or some ideas, um, you can ask questions there and, and people will, um, you know, give advice or try and answer mm -hmm. your question the best you can. Um, a good one for if you're looking for, you know, resources is the Canadian Homeschooler. Uh, dot com and it has a lot of different types of things that you can do with your child and tips I mean it covers everything they even do a homeschool conference once a year it ha it's already happened but um, you know there's just a lot uh, that you can find um, online Awesome. I, and, uh, I know there's probably a lot more information, but always, you know, check your local, I, I think folklore is even doing, um, they've even doing delivery service and that sort of thing so that there's no contact and whatsoever where you can get worksheets and that sort of thing. Julia, I want to thank you so much for sharing your tips with us today and taking the time to do, uh, to go over all these great ideas on how, how to help uh, keep our kids in our, in the education system until we can all get back to normal. So thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome.